Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. There's this little town in Georgia called Santa Claus. It has less than 250 residents, and it's what you might expect of a kitschy, quaint, small southern town named for the jolliest man in pop culture. Folks leave up their Christmas decorations year-round. The street names are also thematic. Prancer Street, Rudolph Way, Candy Cane Road. People from all over the country bring their Christmas cards to be postmarked at the small Santa Claus post office. But like many small rural towns, Santa Claus also suffers from poverty and addiction. And on December 3rd, 1997, evil came to Dasher Street in Santa Claus. A young man the family once fostered took a shotgun and killed four of the Daniels family. Mom Kim, Dad Danny, 17-year-old Jessica, and little 8-year-old Bryant. He left a toddler and a baby there blood-soaked and terrified, and he took three little girls with him. Welcome to episode 35, Santa Claus, Georgia, The Daniels Family Murders. Santa Claus, Georgia is in Tombs County. Known as Bloody Tombs, the area has quite the reputation for violence. The violent crime rate in that county is 61.8, while the national average is 31.1. The tiny town of Santa Claus sits on the onion fields of southern Georgia, close to Vidalia home of the world-famous Sweet Onions. It's about halfway between Savannah and Macon. In 1941, a pecan farmer named C.G. Green was sick of watching people pass up his pecan stand for others a bit down the road and came up with an ingenious idea. Everyone loves Santa Claus, right? Though he grew up in a poor farming family, he had cherished memories of the caroling, roasting pecans, and the storytelling that happened every Christmas with his family. So he named his farm Santa Claus, and it was situated on the side of U.S. Highway 1, and people did stop and notice. Soon other families moved there and kept with the Christmas theme, naming the unpaved roads cheery reindeer names. The town has always stayed small, and has always been a sort of drive-by curio of sorts, because then and now, People who choose to live there keep with tradition and leave their Christmas decorations up all year. And there is a sign that reads Santa Claus, Georgia loves children. And one family in the late 90s really epitomized that spirit. Kim and Danny Daniels were a blended family. Danny was a straight arrow postman with a daughter from a previous marriage. But Kim had a very checkered past. She went into foster care at the age of three when her own father was murdered, and her mother abandoned her and her siblings. Though she finally landed with a loving family by the name of Drigger when she was in her teens, she had already suffered lonely and neglected in the Georgia foster care system. While no foster care system is perfect, much less given enough funding, Georgia has long been considered one of the worst, with exposés written every decade or so. The AJC ran an article in 2010 which cited an investigation that found an agency that actually forced exorcisms on children to rid them of demons. And that's just a drop in the bucket. Kim considered the Driggers her real family, but no matter how much they loved her and tried to give her a better life, the damage had been done. She had been through 52 different foster homes as a child, 17 in one year. Too many cold nights without enough dinner, too many lonely Christmases and birthdays with no presents, watching as birth children were showered with gifts. Kim was an alcoholic and drug addict before she even quit high school, and the cycle just continued. By the time Kim sought help, she had three of her own children placed in foster care. Her oldest daughter, Brandy, was born of an early marriage. When Kim and her first husband divorced, he got custody of Brandy, and Kim kept spiraling in her depression and addictions. She gave birth to a daughter named Amber in 1986, and the twins named Bryant and Brooke in 1989. 
Their father left not long after the twins were born, and the Department of Family and Children's Services took her children when the twins were still babies. She moved to Lyons, Georgia, and kept spiraling until she reconnected with her sister Connie. Kim realized the profound effect that foster care had had on their lives and decided to clean up and get her kids back. It took her two years. In the spring of 1992, Kim Driggers showed up at the Mount Vernon Pentecostal Church. Barefoot and in jeans, she walked into the church and was met with open arms. The Mount Vernon Church was known for welcoming sinners. They went out of their way to do community outreach. And the Pentecostal religion is one of the strictest of evangelical Protestantism. From women being discouraged from cutting their hair and only allowed to wear dresses, to strict rules on social activities, this is not the sort of church you would think a recovering drug addict would be attracted to. They speak in tongues, they wash feet, and they even believe in divine healing. But Kim Driggers had heard about this particular church and their welcoming stance, and from the moment she joined, they never let her down. Through the church, she got clean, got her own apartment, and finally found a job. She worked really hard, and by the time she went to court to get Amber back, she even had social services on her side. It wasn't long before she had the twins back, too. At Mount Vernon, she met a man about 10 years her senior named Danny Daniels. As I mentioned, Danny was a very godly man. He loved his rural postal route in Santa Claus, he loved his church, and he loved his daughter. When he and Kim got together, neither of them took it lightly. They took it slowly for the sake of their children, and when they did marry, it was like they were a family that had always been together. Kim even reconnected with her oldest daughter, Brandy, who often came to visit on the weekends. And a couple of years into their marriage, they decided to become foster parents. It was Kim's idea. She hated her sad memories of isolation and neglect and wanted to do everything she could to help children in need. Danny agreed, and they became foster parents, sometimes for only a matter of weeks, sometimes longer. At the time of their deaths, they had started the paperwork to adopt the three foster children living with them. Kim was a stay-at-home mom. She worked from sunup to bedtime with children ranging in age from a few months old to teenagers. It was hard work, but she loved it. She had truly found her calling. At this time, I'm going to pause to hear a word from one of our sponsors. One of the children to come through the Daniels household was a little red-headed girl named Joanna Mosley. She had been taken from her mother, Mary Latrell Mosley, for neglect. Latrell Mosley had quite the history of abuse and neglect of her children, but even though she didn't care about their well-being, she'd be damned if she would have them taken away from her. In his book, Fear Came to Town, Doug Crandall posits that Latrell was part of the cultural history of the Bloody Tombs County. You didn't let things go. You didn't make peace. You got even. Latrell Mosley did not take slights lightly, and she practiced voodoo. I am not putting allegedly or supposedly before the word voodoo because it's in court records and is public knowledge. Latrell was proud of it, and her kids were known to make threats about their mama putting curses on their enemies. And don't think that Latrell was out there in her beliefs. Voodoo, or root, is more common than you would think, especially in the coastal empire, the gorgeous region that starts in Savannah and spreads over 14 counties in Georgia. Called root because of the various mushrooms, plants, and roots that are ground down into powder, it has been practiced for centuries, originally coming from Africa. And all of Latrell's children were known to talk about mama's powders. Ten-year-old Joanna Mosley was a challenge in the Daniels household from the start. She was needier than Kim and Danny were used to. She craved attention and affection, and as they usually did, the Daniels invited Joanna to call them mom and dad. So she did. Kim developed great patience with Joanna, laughing when Joanna would get mad and threaten her with her mama's powders to curse her. Kim reportedly said, well, she better make it an aspirin because you're giving me a headache. Despite her behavior, Joanna was starting to fit in with the Daniels family. 
But regardless, those kind of relationships are complicated. She felt conflicted about her mother, which isn't at all unusual. She felt sorry for Luttrell, and she missed her half-brother, Jerry Scott Heidler. Joanna confided her feelings in Kim, and Kim wanted to do the right thing. She understood how the little girl felt, and thought if there was a chance that she could help repair that mother-daughter relationship, then she would. She drove Joanna to see Luttrell and Alma about an hour from Santa Claus. These trips started off fine. Luttrell was open to visits with her daughter and this nice lady who took her in. And Kim also got to know Joanna's half-brother, Jerry Scott Heidler. But he was introduced to her as Scott Taylor, and that's the name the rest of the Daniels family knew as well. Kim even got Luttrell and Jerry, a.k.a. Scott, to attend their church in Mount Vernon and she recognized really quickly that Scott had a severe alcohol and drug problem. Some people might find it strange that she would want to expose her children to a young man with these issues, but Kim was a loving and forgiving woman who really thought she could help Jerry Scott Heidler. She had lived the life of an addict and believed in second chances. So she and Danny offered to take him in to live with them, even though he was 18 and out of the foster care system. Joanna had decided to go back to Luttrell, but Jerry took Kim and Danny up on their offer. I believe had they known Jerry Scott's full history, they never would have invited him to stay. Jerry had had open heart surgery for a birth defect at age four, and while it was serious, for the rest of his life, he fell back on it as an excuse, as did his mother. You can't fuss at Jerry, you can't upset Jerry, you can't punish Jerry, and you can't force him to do anything because of his fragile heart. But I don't mean to sound like I'm blaming this on a child. This was Latrell's doing. She was the kind of woman who would let the Department of Children and Family Services take her kids because she couldn't afford to feed them, only to turn around and actually hire a lawyer to get them back. The woman was a raging alcoholic and extremely vindictive but she did have an unusual love for her children. She would insist on Jerry's innocence to the very end, even though he confessed. And Latrell herself did not have an easy life. She married the first time at age 15, which produced her oldest son, Ralph. Ralph was later arrested for child molestation and incestuous conduct. This is what I mean when I say Kim and Danny couldn't have known really what all Jerry, a.k.a. Scott, had been through. Latrell's next marriage produced his older brother, George, who beat the shit out of Jerry and his older siblings, Steve and Lisa. George learned this behavior from their stepfather, Lawton Mosley, Latrell's third husband, a vicious drunk who was abusive to all of his stepchildren. And the kids started acting out. They were constantly sent to juvie for petty crimes. None of the older kids finished high school. They just immediately started running the streets, getting high, and adding to their rap sheets. Neighbors were constantly calling DCFS on Latrell's family, and she knew it. Jerry Scott Heidler grew up in this chaotic environment in Latrell and Lawton's tiny trailer, where starving, screaming, and beatings were just a way of life. In 1985, Jerry had his first real visit with a social worker, and his case file in the end would be long and pitiful. The family was on food stamps often had their gas and electricity cut off, and neither Lawton nor Latrell bothered to find work. Caseworker visits noted the home was quite deplorable and too small for the family. One lady from DCFS found Jerry coatless and playing in mud puddles in his socks in the winter. By kindergarten, he was already acting out in school. He was held back in kindergarten and again in the first grade due to learning disabilities and was eventually diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. In 1986, one social worker who visited the trailer noted that Lisa and Jerry slept in the same bed together. This isn't unusual for siblings, especially in poorer families, but something just didn't sit right with her. She told Latrell they shouldn't be sleeping in the same bed, but Latrell insisted everything was fine. Lisa and Jerry were three years apart, and she simply read him to sleep. In another family, this might sound plausible, but the thought of any of these kids reading another to sleep sounds preposterous. And while we cannot know for sure what went on, we do know that Jerry's older brother was convicted of child molestation and incest. Jerry grew up with him, with the same influences. 
Latrell decided it was time to move the family after this visit. She often pulled up stakes and found a new trailer when she knew neighbors and DCFS were talking about her again. Jerry already struggled with school, but with little food and no bedtimes, he was always tired and irritable at school. By age 11, Jerry had committed his first crime. He was charged with two counts of criminal trespass and one for burglary for breaking into a neighbor's trailer and stealing some change and soda. The juvenile judge reprimanded Luttrell more than Jerry, rightly so, and she ordered that he be placed on probation for one year and put in the custody of relatives. So Jerry moved in with his aunt and uncle on his father's side in Alma. They ran an egg farm, and Jerry at first seemed to take to the stability and peace of farm life. He actually even started focusing more in school. But then, Latrell began harassing his aunt and uncle. When she got her mind set on something, she was like a dog with a bone. She wore down the kind couple, who instead of giving Jerry back to her, turned him over to the sheriff's department. Social services tried to find a placement for Jerry, but were unable to place him, so he went right back to that hellish trailer in Alma with his mother, stepfather, and five siblings. Jerry was placed in two different foster homes in the next few months, one with a really caring foster mother named Sylvia Boatwright. But his problems just continued. He often ran away or played with tools and machinery that were dangerous. He told tales about his family's devil worship and curses. He threatened other children and adults. He made trouble at school to the point that he had to be isolated from other children. In 1988, Jerry's mental problems could no longer be dealt with in the public school system. He was transferred to the Harrell Center in Waycross, Georgia, where he finally received a complete psychological evaluation. Jerry was painfully honest with the doctor, admitting to smoking, using snuff, and even drinking. He was 11 years old, and he had the history of a grown man with a rap sheet. The doctor noted that he did not know how to deal with his emotions and dealt with them in, quote, self-defeating, unmodulated ways, including threatening and aggressive behavior. He was again diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, but this time was prescribed Ritalin. When he took his medication, his behavior at school did improve, if only slightly. He was supposed to see a counselor once a week and wear his eyeglasses, which he had often refused to wear. The problem was getting Jerry to take his medication. He was back with the boat rights, and despite all of Sylvia's care and hard work, the boy still had issues. Compounding that problem was Luttrell's jealousy. She was back to her old ways, laying curses on Sylvia and the social workers, just sure they were doing this out of spite and were out to get her. She wanted her son back, and she made no bones about it. She harassed the boat rights in their workplaces, but they trudged on with Jerry despite the numerous issues. He was kicked off the school bus for fighting, and an older kid even fractured his arm in one of these fights. It was around this time that he became fascinated with killing things, and he was open about his urges and daydreams. In one evaluation, he admitted he was embarrassed that he couldn't read. His next psych evaluation detailed this and more. Quote, projective testing indicates that Jerry is a very angry young man. He often displays this anger with aggression toward other children and extreme cruelty to animals. He has many negative expectations for himself and truly perceives himself as bad. He seems proud of the trouble he gets into simply because it brings him attention. Jerry Scott Heidler exhibited all of the classic warning signs, including self-mutilation, when he scratched his arms and legs causing sores and smeared the blood on his skin. He was into violent comic books and video games. A neighbor chased him away from a stray cat he was shooting with a BB gun, watching it fall pitifully and try to get back up and run away. He also became suicidal. He once stood in the road in front of an oncoming semi-truck. The truck screeched to a halt with a very angry driver jumping out to berate Jerry. And right before his 12th birthday, he strung a noose to a tree and climbed on a bucket, put the noose around his neck, and kicked the bucket out from under him. This time he was saved when Latrell happened to walk out into the yard. Just a few days later, he tried to smother Joanna, who was two and a half at the time, with a pillow. Latrell again stopped him and just fussed at him, clearly not taking anything he did seriously like a normal parent would. Jerry later said that same weekend was the first time he got drunk and smoked pot. 
At his next counseling session, he admitted trying to kill himself. That's the thing about Jerry Scott Heidler. He told responsible adults. He did more than a lot of kids would in that situation. And the counselor did take him seriously. He was sent to a Savannah psychiatric hospital and stayed for two months. He was taken off Ritalin and prescribed an antidepressant. After the two months, his doctors felt he was stable enough to go home for a few days. But of course, once he was back with Latrell for just a little bit of time, she called the hospital and said he was much better and that she would not be bringing him back. Latrell was always the stumbling block to Jerry's mental health. He would take two steps forward and she'd drag him three steps back. Though she was a terrible parent, her pride would not allow her to do what was right for her kids. Within weeks, Jerry was back to his regular behavior at school. He started talking about killing himself, pets, family members, and also said he had auditory and visual hallucinations. Official complaints were made by other parents when Jerry would assault or threaten their children. He was constantly yo-yoing between school, social workers, and psychologists, always to be spit back out of the system into Latrell's waiting clutches. By the time he was 16, Jerry quit school. He was now heavily addicted to alcohol, marijuana, huffing paint or oven cleaner, prescription meds, and he was experimenting with LSD and mushrooms and, of course, meth. He was clearly self-medicating. He stood over six feet tall, but weighed only 120 pounds. He lived on Mountain Dew and junk food when he bothered to eat. He was obsessed with violent video games and the movie Death Warrant, which he talked about incessantly. He met a girl named Maria Spivey and had a baby boy with her named Joshua. Maria was married to another man, and though she stayed in the relationship with Jerry, she also stayed in her marriage. It was an odd situation, but then Jerry Scott Heidler was used to odd. By the time he was 18, Joanna, at 10 years old, was removed from Latrell's home, and Jerry was introduced to the Daniels family as Scott Taylor. Joanna was back with Latrell by age 11 and was treated for a vaginal infection, revealing that she was already sexually active and Scott Taylor had been invited to stay with the loving and giving Daniels family, who had no idea who the real Scott Taylor was. And now I'm going to pause to hear a final word from our sponsors. Jerry, known as Scott, stayed off and on with the Daniels family. They didn't push him one way or another, and after a few weeks, this worked out. But one day, Danny Daniels and his friend by the name of Guy Aaron were cleaning the gutters on the Dasher Street home, and they saw and heard Jerry interacting with Danny's teenage daughter, Jessica. Danny knew he would soon need to put a stop to Scott coming over. Even Jessica had become wary. Sometimes Scott was nice and flirty. Other times, he was outright mean and even threw things at their family dog. Things went on like this for a bit, but finally even Kim knew there was nothing she could do to help Jerry. And unfortunately, she had brought Jerry and his mother to their church. The ever-generous Mount Vernon Church was open to Latrell's family. They helped her however they could, whether it was food, clothes, or a bit of money to tide the family over. But it got to where Latrell was showing up and demanding large sums of money, like she was entitled to it. And the church started giving her a firm no. Not long after this, Danny made up his mind and knew he had to talk to Scott. And I'm sorry if I'm confusing you with his names. The Daniels family thought Jerry's name was Scott, and it's difficult to keep switching up in the story. But so you know, Jerry often went by the other name to avoid being associated with his long rap sheet or just because he liked being a different person. At trial, there was even some hint of two personalities, though that was never substantiated. It was early December and Kim had been gearing up for Christmas for months. After all her bleak childhood Christmases, she worked really hard to give her children and foster children a magical Christmas. She was happily sneaking hidden presents from the attic and wrapping them. Danny got up at 5 a.m. as usual for his mail route and thought all day about how to talk to Scott. In the end, he decided not to confront him about his suspicions, about his character or his drug use. He would just simply say that Jessica was too young for him. When he got to Latrell's trailer, he and Jerry sat on the steps, and Danny just bluntly told him that he could no longer come by the house. Jerry basically shrugged, and that was the end of it. 
they never spoke again. Naturally, while Jerry took this banishment in stride, Latrell was outraged. She had been shunned by the church, and now she thought the Daniels family were too high and mighty for her family. She'd show them. Latrell got her old Buick running and went over to the Daniels' home. She sat at the end of their driveway for a bit, smoking and trying to decide what to do. She was not particularly in the mood to spend the night in jail. So she floored the Buick and started doing donuts in their front yard. The home on Dasher Street was in a more deserted part of town with larger lots. It's likely that the neighbors didn't see what she did, but may have just seen her leaving. When Danny got home, he was more amused than angry. He had been worried about public confrontations and vengeance at the church or the kids' schools. Latrell had basically pissed on his territory to make her point, and he just had to laugh. But this was almost a year to the day when Jerry Scott Hilo would destroy his family. Jerry saw the Daniels family in town a few times and acted like he didn't know them. During this year, he sunk deeper into alcohol and drugs. He couch surfed, generally falling asleep wherever he had hung out that night. He started drinking in the morning and roaming the streets for his next fix. He never had a job, something that wasn't unusual in Latrell's family, but Jerry was often excused for his weak heart. Also during that year, he got Maria Spivey pregnant again. This only seemed to magnify Jerry's problems. He started borrowing friends' cars even though he didn't have a license and was arrested for drunk driving, among many other things over that year. At the Daniels' home, Kim was once again in high gear for the Christmas season. The house was overflowing with seven kids. They were fostering an eight-year-old girl named Amanda, a four-year-old boy named Corey, and a ten-month-old baby named Gabriel. Kim and Danny had already decided to adopt the three foster children. They had started the process and were to sign the papers in the new year. On November 29, 1997, Jerry went by and saw his girlfriend, Maria Spivey. Her baby was almost due, but she was not feeling well. Her first pregnancy had been easy, but this was different. Jerry was actually the one who insisted that Maria go to the hospital. He paced the waiting room after she was admitted, and there were even rumors it might not be his child. Maria later admitted she wasn't sure who the father was. It was uncharacteristic of the irresponsible, seemingly unfeeling drug addict that was Jerry Scott Heidler. He even wrote a poem while waiting for the birth. Hours later, Maria's mother came out and informed him that the baby, a little boy, was stillborn. Jerry reacted with his usual numb shrug and left the hospital. But when the child was laid to rest on December 2nd, he showed up at the graveside and cried hysterically. He insisted, that Mar- he insisted that Maria read the poem he had written. Everyone was surprised by his reaction, and Maria said it sent him into a deep depression. On December 2nd, he was out at the rental house Maria shared with her parents, younger siblings, and her child with Jerry. He repeatedly asked her to read the poem to him. He also sat on the couch and watched cartoons with her younger sisters. A news report about a 14-year-old boy in Paducah, Kentucky, who had opened fire on his classmates as they were at a prayer meeting came on the TV. Jerry got up and asked Maria to take him to his mother's. Though Latrell knew about the stillbirth, Jerry hadn't been home since. At first, everything was fine. His sisters, Lisa and Joanne, hugged him, and everyone was catching up. Then Latrell started in on him about the baby. And then his brother came in and brought up the rumor that the baby wasn't even Jerry's. A huge fight started, and then quickly ended when Jerry put on his coat, walked out the door, and started drinking. He went over to a man named Jerry Johnson's house. Mr. Johnson was in a wheelchair and welcomed company. He had a pool table and kept the fridge stocked, and didn't mind if some of the younger guys in the neighborhood took advantage of him. He was just lonely. He later said he was surprised by how much Jerry Heidler talked that night. Usually a sullen young man, that night he went on and on about the stillbirth of his son. Johnson and another friend who was over would try to change the subject, and Jerry would turn it right back around to the baby. Finally, he did fall quiet, just drinking and looking morose, and around 8 o'clock, he and the other friend left so Mr. Johnson could go to bed. They hung out in an alleyway drinking and smoking cigarettes before saying goodbye around 11 o'clock. And then Jerry went back to Mr. Johnson's house. 
He crept in and stole the keys to his van along with a few dollars, a gold chain, and his social security check. And then he took off, headed straight for Santa Claus, straight to the people he wanted to take his hurt out on, straight to the happy family that was the antithesis to what he had been brought up in. As I said before, the Daniels' home was in a more deserted part of town. Dasher Street actually ended at their driveway. Jerry got there, got out, and sat on the steps, drinking a few more beers. There were two yard dogs that never barked. They either remembered Jerry's scent or were afraid of him. I'm guessing a combination of both. He then went and got a stepladder from the shed and took it to the bathroom window. His thin frame easily slipped through the window, and soon he was creeping down the hallway of the Daniels' home. Everyone was asleep. There was no noise. He stood in the dining room for a bit, smoking two cigarettes, and then grinding them into the carpet. And then he headed for the gun cabinet. He knew exactly where it was, and that it also held ammunition. At about 1.30 in the morning, on what would be Kim and Danny's fifth wedding anniversary, December 3rd, 1997, Jerry Scott Heidler walked right into their bedroom and opened fire with a double-barrel shotgun. Kim died almost instantly. Danny did not. He tried to get up and put his arms up in defense, but the next shot brought him down. You can only imagine the fear at the sound of a shotgun blast in the small house in the middle of the night. Jessica, the oldest, now 17, first ran to the bathroom where Jerry had gotten in but Jerry turned down the hall to the room where the little boys slept. Four-year-old Corey was hiding in the closet. But eight-year-old Bryant, perhaps frozen in fear, was still on the top bunk. The shotgun blast took off most of his head. And then Jerry reloaded. Jessica ran from the bathroom to her parents' bedroom with Jerry right on her heels. He fired the shotgun directly into the back of her head, blowing apart her skull. He then reloaded again and shot Danny Daniels one more time. Then he heard a small voice call out, Scott? Remember, the Daniels family knew Jerry as Scott Taylor. It was eight-year-old Brooke's voice, Bryant's twin sister. She and her half-sister, ten-year-old Amber, and their foster sister, eight-year-old Amanda, were huddled together and crying and wondering what was going on. Jerry quickly lied and told the little girls that someone was in the house and they needed to come quickly, without coats or shoes. He ushered them into the van. It was less than 40 degrees outside. By now, little Corey was at the window crying. Jerry pointed the shotgun at him, but finally lowered it and got in the van. The little girls sat together in the back seat, whispering as Jerry drove silently. When Amber finally asked where they were going, Jerry said he was taking them to a friend's house on Candy Cane Road for safety. But when Amber pointed out that he had passed that road, he bluntly told the girls that he had kidnapped them. The girls were terrified and so confused. They thought of Scott as a fun foster brother, someone they trusted. They didn't know the real Jerry Scott Heidler and could barely comprehend what was happening to them. He drove until he got to the bridge on the Altamaha River. By now, the girls were crying, and Amber begged him to throw away the shotgun because he was scaring them. Surprisingly, he did. He tossed it over the bridge. But then, when he wasn't looking, the girls tried to run. He ran them down and took them back into the van. He took Amber into the back of the van and molested her. The formal charge later included sodomy. He then took Amanda and began molesting her, but stopped. He had decided he was done and he let the girls go. He left them on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere, but at least they were alive, and at least he had stopped the assaults. The girls held hands and ran, their little feet freezing. They walked up to the first house they saw with lights. They knocked on the door, but when a man came out, they were afraid again. He called for his wife, who saw the girls and ran out with a blanket, scooping them up and bringing them inside. The man then called the Alma Police Department, and an officer quickly came and questioned the little girls. Sobbing, Brooke managed to get out the words, Santa Claus. And finally calming them down, they were able to tell the officer that a man they knew as Scott Taylor had kidnapped them. The police officer called the Toombs County Sheriff's Department. At around 5 a.m., 
Deputy Michael Harlan drove from Lyons, Georgia, to Santa Claus and then turned onto Dasher Street. He was surprised to see every light on in the house. Jerry had methodically went and turned on every light. For what reason, we don't know. The front door was open, and he pulled his weapon and went inside. Corey was crying hysterically and said Mama and Daddy are dead. Brother Guy killed them. Guy Aaron was Danny's best friend and the only other man young Corey had ever seen with a gun. He hadn't actually seen Jerry Heidler that night, and his confused little mind made this connection. As Deputy Harlan walked through the home, he stepped into the boys' room and found what was left of Small Bryant on the bunk bed. He walked backwards out of the room so as not to disturb evidence, and then he went to the master bedroom. Little baby Gabriel was clinging to a bed sheet near Kim, crying while music was blasting from the radio alarm. The scene was worse than anything the deputy had ever seen. He picked up the crying baby, took Corey's hand, and took them to his squad car to call it in. By 11 that morning, the GBI had called in to help question the little girls. Amanda, the eight-year-old foster daughter, seemed the most coherent. The GBI agent gave her photo arrays to look through. She picked out Jerry Scott Heidler and said, that's him, that's Scott Taylor. He's the one who put us in the van and did the bad stuff. After Amanda, Amber and Brooke were also questioned. They picked out the same photo and told the same horrific story. By afternoon, Santa Claus, Georgia was in the national news. News correspondents were flying in from all over the country to cover the story, and crime scene investigators from Macon and Atlanta were carefully inspecting the Daniels home. Jerry's DNA would later be found on the cigarettes he had ground into the floor, and also on Amber from the sexual assault. Back at the station, the sheriff called the social workers from the Department of Family and Children's Services who knew the family so well. These were the same women who had helped Kim get her own kids back, and then watched proudly as she blossomed into a foster mother herself. They were heartbroken, and determined to help make this as easy on the children as they could. They gently questioned them to help get more information for the police. Then they swung into action, calling around and finding emergency foster homes immediately. When Corey and Gabriel came to the station, Corey immediately told the girls that Mama and Daddy were dead. Then the officers had the heartbreaking job of telling the girls that Jessica and Brooke's twin brother Bryant were dead as well. Jerry Scott Heidler was back in Alma, sleeping peacefully on his mother's couch. Not a care in the world. It harkens back to one psych evaluation he had as a child that read, quote, Jerry has potential for harming himself and others with little actual afterthought or remorse. Meanwhile, the GBI had Latrell's trailer staked out. They didn't know how they'd be taking Jerry in, if more dead people were inside or if he'd come out shooting. Finally, they knocked on the door, and Steve Heidler opened it looking nervous and said his brother wasn't home but the sheriff's deputies surrounding the house had already noticed a disturbing opening to the crawl space and started shouting, he's under the house. Two agents pulled Jerry Scott Heidler from under the house. He was quickly booked into the county jail and sat down for questioning by two agents. He fidgeted and barely spoke above a whisper. Finally, one agent said, now Jerry, we're going to talk about what happened out there in Santa Claus, okay? And Jerry Scott Heidler answered, I went berserk, I guess. He then admitted to everything. He did claim there are gaps in his memory from that day, which could be possible or could be a lie. With Jerry, it's hard to tell. But an odd characteristic of Jerry was his honesty. He did usually tell the truth, and he did tell what he had done. Jerry Scott Heidler's trial was not about guilt or innocence. It was about if he would live or die. If he was found guilty but mentally ill, his life would be spared. I could take you through the entire bleak trial, but I think you know what is coming. Though Jerry had two excellent attorneys, one who specialized in death penalty cases, it was not enough to save his life. His crimes were too heinous. The jury deliberated less than 40 minutes, and Jerry Scott Heidler was found guilty on four counts of malice murder, kidnapping with bodily injury, two counts of kidnapping, aggravated sodomy, aggravated child molestation, child molestation, and burglary. At the penalty phase of his trial, four death sentences were handed down. 
Despite the mountains of evidence from his years in and out of psychiatric hospitals with different counselors and caseworkers, Jerry had passed the competency hearings to stand trial. Doctors now found that he knew right from wrong. He just didn't give a damn. I'm not here to tell you he deserves leniency. But one of the things that kills me about this case is how pitiful his life was, and how often he did tell the truth. He went to responsible adults. But after years of neglect and abuse and the influence of Latrell Mosley, Jerry Scott Heidler was a veritable sociopath. And you should have heard the crocodile tears Latrell Mosley cried on the stand for her son, insisting on his innocence. Classic Latrell, denying, lying, but in her twisted way, she still loved her son. This whole case is a tragedy of Shakespearean proportions. Kim Driggers Daniels pulled herself out of addiction and poverty to become a loving wife, mother, and foster mother to other children in need. It is truly a profound tale of redemption that ends in such twisted tragedy. A young man whom Kim had tried to take in and help destroyed her, her family, and the town of Santa Claus. I highly suggest reading Doug Crandall's Fear Came to Town, The Santa Claus Georgia Murders if you are interested in learning more about this sad story. Aside from much more detail about Jerry's childhood, there is also more of Kim's story and her loving marriage to Danny. And he goes into great detail on the trial, before which Jerry even managed to escape from jail, though he was caught quickly. Jerry Scott Heidler remains on George's death row, awaiting execution. The Daniels family murders in Santa Claus, Georgia were a stain on the small town for years. It takes folks quite a while to forget a tragedy like that. I did see a fairly recent article on southernthing.com that cheerfully depicts the tiny town and tells of the year-round Christmas spirit, the post office with a special box for letters to Santa, and the celebrations when actual Christmas comes around. There is no mention of the murders. The town has finally healed, or at the very least, it has forgotten, and is once again a cheery tourist attraction. People still come from miles all around just to get their Christmas cards stamped there. The Daniels family tragedy is pushed out of their memories as people flock to Santa Claus, Georgia, the town that loves children. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. Today's episode is also brought to you by my biggest Patreon supporter, Megan Bullard. Thank you so much for your support, Megan. I could not do this without the generosity of patrons like you. As always, if you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. You can also listen directly from Spreaker, my network online, or on their app. And I'm also on Stitcher, CastBox, and many other podcatchers. If you are interested in supporting the show, I have a Patreon page with many different rewards for different levels of donation. Or you can just visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com, where you can make a one-time donation just by hitting the donate button. I also have a merchandise store open. Just go to whatamaneuver.net and click on Shop by Store, then search for Southern Fried True Crime. I have all sorts of t-shirts, tanks, hoodies, and even onesies for babies. If you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I love hearing from you guys, and I'm always looking for new cases, so please feel free to reach out. I'm also all over social media. Just search the show name in your favorite platform if you'd like to connect with me there. If you are interested in discussing the Santa Claus murders or any other episodes further, come check out my discussion group. It is linked to my Southern Fried True Crime Facebook page. And we don't just discuss cases, we share memes, make friends, and even recently debated the pronunciation of the word pecan. You heard my vote, and for the record, only you heathens pronounce it pecan. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.